I thought I would focus here uh, precisely on some of Oliver Sacks' notions about artificial intelligence and personal computers and things like that. I'll read you a couple of passages and then open it up to conversation, but I thought I'd give you a little background first. Oliver published what may be his masterpiece and is certainly the originary, the Ur piece of his life, Awakenings, in 1973. Uh, at that time, it, w it would become, I mean, I think it is one of the great books of the last half of the 20th century. Uh, absolutely Melvillian in scope. It's an amazing book. Um, but it was completely ignored and, and, in fact, to the extent in the medical community, largely rejected or dismissed uh, when it came out. How many of you have, uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have read the book? And if I asked differently, how many if I would answer not personally, but you feel like you know what it's about? Uh, I'll give you a sense of it uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, in 1918, uh, right after World War I, there was an absolutely horrific influenza outbreak that in three months killed more people than the entire war had killed before that. Over 200 million people contracted the influenza, 20 million of them died in those, in those few months. Of those who survived, uh, later on, uh, about four or five years, mysteriously, one at a time, and especially among the youngest, by no means all of them, but, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, from one minute to the next, it, these are people in their 20s and 30s in the very vital middle of their lives, and, from one moment to the next, they simply came to a stop. Um, at first, people were f finding this out in their own families and couldn't figure it out, and gradually it became clear this was happening in a lot of places. It rather quickly became as known and as horrifying as AIDS was and still is today. This continued for about five years. Uh, and then just disappeared. And the amazing thing about it is that the sleepy sickness, as it was called, sleeping sickness, was then repressed almost entirely from the world's consciousness. People just not, did not want to think about it. Families took care of their individual living statues for as long as they could, but gradually they couldn't, and they eventually started uh, putting them in institutions that were founded for the pur purpose, the one that Oliver would later work at, was, had, has to this day over its lintel uh, the phrase, home for the incurable. Hundreds of, of these patients uh, were warehoused there, living statues. People kind of didn't know what to make of them and just kind of assumed that they were basically vegetables. As the years passed, many of them died. They were replaced by other uh, people, more standard catatonics and dementia patients, Alzheimer's patients, extreme Parkinsonians, stroke victims, and so forth. And when Oliver arrived in 1966 at, at this place, its name was Beth Abraham, uh, uh, he had, he was the first person in, in decades to notice that some of these patients uh, among the 500 patients there who were just basically being warehoused were different from the others. That they were, uh, that, that, and he, and he went, started looking back through their records and it turned out that he figured out that about 80 of the 500 went back to the founding years of the place and were these kinds of living statues. And far more audaciously, but also horrifyingly, harrowingly, he became convinced that they were completely alive inside. Neurologists had been seeing these patients for years, but nobody had bothered thinking that, because usually they would just look at the chart and go on. And he, by contrast, would spend hours and hours of the individual patients and trying to figure out what was going on. Some years later, in 1969, he had been living in California for five years, uh, and during which time he had been a uh, prodigious user of drugs. He'd been involved in a leather scene. He was in, uh, on the edges of, of uh, Hell's Angels, where he was known as Dr. Squat. 
because uh, he also happened to be the California State heavyweight lifting champion. Um, he was quite a character, but, but I think uh, uh, this was a brief period in his life after which he quit all that stuff called Turkey. And, uh, and years uh, later, uh, some years later, shows up at, at Beth Abraham, and I think it had to do with some of these incredible drug experiences he's had that allowed him to kind of imagine that there might be life going on in there. In any case, uh, the famous part of the, of the book is, and that is dramatized in the film is that it, by 1969, L-DOPA has surfaced and is at the time being thought of almost messianically as a wonder drug to cure all Parkinson's types diseases. It's being celebrated everywhere and he decides somewhat reluctantly to admit, administer to the patients and uh, the effect is astonishing. From one day to the next, one by one, they all come right back to life. Um, years later, I had occasion to interview one of those uh, people, and I asked her, this was now 12, 13 years later, if she remembered what it was like when she suddenly came to life again, and she said, oh, yes. I said, uh, what was it like? And she said, well, suddenly I was talking. And I said, do you remember uh, your first words? And she said, oh, yes. I said, what were they after 30 years? She said, I said, ooh, I'm talking. <laughs> that actually does sound like a computer, kind of think of it. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, then they went through that last, the, the spring-like awakening lasted for about four weeks. Then they began having more and more horrible side effects, absolutely terrifying side effects, a period of tribulation of bedlam. And then on the far side, they, accommodated a period of accommodation, which is by the time I saw the ones that were still around, they were in this kind of crumpled, better than they had been before, not as good as they were during the awakening, not as bad as they were in tribulation, but they had kind of come to their balance center. Anyway, uh, Oliver wrote the book Awakenings in 1973, and it consists of a series of 20 case studies. and. When it came out, it was extravagantly praised by people like W.H. Auden and Frank Kermode, uh, great literary. It won a prize for imaginative literature. But that was kind of the problem, because doctors generally in those days, and it was an extremely quantitative period in, in neurology, where it was population studies and so forth. They said, well, you know, why weren't there double blind controls on this, you know, why wasn't this peer reviewed, you know, where are all the charts and so forth. And Oliver had emphatically not done it that way. He'd gone back to an earlier tradition of looking at the patients one by one. He used to say that he was a clinical ontologist. Um, we would go on rounds and he would say, I'm a clinical ontologist, uh, you know, ontologist, well, Aesthetics is the philosophy of beauty, and epistemology is the philosophy of knowledge and belief. Uh, ontology is the philosophy of being, of why is there something rather than nothing? What is the, is the nature of is, as Clinton would later say. And he, he would say, he's a clinical ontologist, a man for whom, a, a, a clinician for whom the question is, how are you? How do you be? What is it like to be you? And as the years went by, he, this became more and more a question for him, him of whether it was possible to have a science of individuals as opposed to populations. He was interested in the intersection, he said, of fate and freedom. He was interested uh, in not in the disease the person had, but in the person who had the disease. And could you do a science of the individual? Now, apparently you couldn't because nobody read Awakenings. Uh, years later, when I began uh, hanging out with him in the early 80s, um, uh, I had occasion to interview his English publisher, uh, Colin Haycraft at Duckworth's. And he told me that in 1982, so this is nine years after it was published, the first edition of the hardcover had been 1,500 books and it had still not sold out. Gives you some idea. 
So Oliver at that point was really a voice in the wilderness and his response in part was to fall into a 10 year writer's block. He had a new book he wanted to write about an accident he'd had, a leg accident in Norway. I'll talk more about that tonight. But the point is that he was, it, it, it was a, he was down to tell a story about his own situation and he was so mm -hmm. befuddled and, and, and stricken by the way he was ignored that he, this writer's block just went on and on and on. And I got to know him during the last four years of that writer's block, what would eventually finally be the, his leg book, um, and uh, called a leg to stand on eventually. But, but the writer's block took the form of graphomania. He was writing millions and millions of words, just not the right words. So you know, I, I would help him with it. There'd be a 100,000 word section and I'd cut it down to 20,000 words. And I'd say, there, we just need this little section right here, a little bridge. I need about 500 words to bridge these two sections. And he'd come back the next day very pleased with himself at having written 50,000 words, you know, and this thing was going on and on. Anyway, the center of my book is four years I spent in the early 80s uh, hanging out with Oliver during what, in retrospect, I think is the hinge moment in his life because he could have just gone down that endlessly churning downward spiral and you would never have heard seen the book nor heard anything more of him. As it happens when he did finally publish the book, parenthetically breaking his other leg the next day uh, after he sent it to the printers, at which point uh, Colin Haycraft, the guy in England, sent him a telegram that said, Oliver, you would do anything for a footnote. Uh, anyway, uh, at that point, uh, he had so much stuff backed up behind it that he published The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat immediately after that, and then, and then he took off and so forth. But I thought I'd read you a few passages um, uh, from that period of hanging out with him and, uh, and give you a sense of what uh, some of the issues that he was worrying about, worrying about and worrying through. One afternoon, he's in the middle of the blockage still at this point. Uh, 1982, one afternoon Oliver calls me wistful. A few weeks ago, I thought I had leukemia and it was quite wonderful. As you may have noticed, I've been dieting. I lost 60 pounds since my last checkup. And he used to say, when I first met him, he, I, uh, he was clean shaven. And I said, God, I, uh, you don't look anything like I thought you were gonna look. And he said, yes, yeah, sometimes I weigh 320 and sometimes I weigh 180. Sometimes I'm bearded and sometimes I'm not. And I said, that must be some beard. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I've lost 60 pounds since my last checkup, and the doctor said he wanted to take another blood test, mentioning that a few months earlier my red blood cell count had been low, that it was surely just a question of my not having eaten, but anyway, between the two halves of that sentence, for a few fractions of a second, I was absolutely certain not only of having leukemia, but I had, that I had only three months to live. At last, I found myself thinking, I'll be rid of my inhibiting neuroses, and I'll be able to write all the books I have backed up in me. Like Luria, his great hero, A.R. Luria, the Soviet neuropsychologist, who had a massive heart attack and yet lived on one further year during which he wrote four books, 40 articles, more than he had in the previous 50 years, and all of it in a calm, lucid, sparkling, clean prose, nothing rushed. For a split second, I saw them all tumbling clear. The Tourette's book, the Five Second book, the Homes and Institutions book, the Leg book, the Dementia book, all in the wake of that wonderful death threat. A pause, two beats. And then the doctor finished his sentence. It's ironic that when he then did die many years later, the same thing happened, basically. Uh, he found out and he had six months and he wrote all kinds of stuff in that period. But A few days later, our conversation turns to the shoddiness of modern living. Oliver is obsessed by the shoddiness of his leased car and of his treatment at the hands of a huge computerized alienating le leasing firm. At root, he insists the problem is the hegemony of the computer model for thinking and organizing. People don't think like, or rather, they start thinking like computers, and computers can't think. Douglas Hofstetter's wrong. He had a thing during those years for Hofstetter. He was really furious at Hofstetter, as he was, by the way, at Minsky. When he first came to America in 1960, the first place he visited was Minsky's lab, and he was in awe of Minsky, and then later he hated him more than anything in some kind of, uh, he tended to be extravagant in all of his opinions. He changed his mind about Hofstadter, actually. I'm not sure about Minsky. The essential point is that a computer cannot judge. 
Any attempt at judgment by a computer involves a loop of infinite regress, a program to judge the program, judging the program, etc. Whereas precisely what human minds ha humans have is a mind, a soul, which puts a stop to regress and takes a stand. Someone needs to finish Hannah Arendt's work. Hannah Arendt had done a book called The Life of the Mind, which by the way is an incredible book if you haven't read it. Uh, and the first volume was on thinking and the second volume was unwilling, and she did not live long enough to write the book on judging. But he said, someone needs to finish Anna Arendt's uh, work, the essential piece, thinking, willing, but then judging. Indeed, I thought he should. Um, anyway, and, and uh, he goes on, oh, well, let's see. Following another week in the, in the Adirondacks, Oliver has finally broken through once again. He keeps breaking through on his book. He has returned with a completed manuscript on convalescence, the conclusion of the leg book. He is chipper. Already he is percolating. He is eager to start work on his dementia book, one which he would like to call in homage to Arendt, Hannah Arendt, The Death of the Mind. By the way, he never did get around to that book, and he was at another point, he said he wanted to write a do for dementia what Piaget had done for childhood. Those of you who've read Piaget know that he, he incredible work on the first five years in terms of the constru construction of a self. It, you know, what a, a, a baby at six months, the sense of the self, and it's at 12 months and at 15 months and so forth. And he wanted to do a similar thing for the deconstruction of the self, uh, a book about dementia. And he said the subtitle of the book would have been How to Love a Demented Person. And he would say that, for example, you don't get angry at a six-month-old baby for not talking. You're so busy being astonished at how much more smart they are than they were two days ago, you know, and, and at this astonishing rate, and that you could have a similar thing going on with a demented person of, of watching with, in awe at one level of what is happening. Anyway, he continues chipper at a book fair in Boston shadowing his antiquarian pal, Eric. He finds a copy of Sir Henry Head's book on neurology. Uh, 800 pages. Head is, as Oliver puts it, one of the grandfathers. He was a teacher of his parents and was in fact Jonathan Miller's father's teacher as well. Jonathan Miller of Beyond the Fringe and the, and the great doctor, neurologist, uh, and uh, theater director. Uh, uh, was a very good friend of his. Uh, at any rate, Head in the early years of the last century intentionally severed a nerve in his arm to observe the process of recuperation. And Al Oliver naturally identifies his leg with Head's arm. By the way, uh, two of the great grandfathers were Sir Henry Head and Lord Brain. <laughs> Not making that up. At dinner this evening, Oliver started out again from Head, reverts to describing his frantic return to London at the peak of the Awakenings drama in August 1969 to catch his breath. So at the peak of tribulation, he just made, he's been working 22 hours a day uh, during that bedlam period for several months, and he just crashes and he goes to London to recuperate um, for a month and, and to put his thoughts in order. And how he had a, indeed proceeded to tap out the first nine case studies of what would eventually become, several years later, the Book of Awakenings. Evenings, he would read the developing chapters to his mother. But it was strange, he recounted, because at the very same moment that I was drafting the most affirmative and generous of case histories, I was also contriving the most constricting, strangulating theory of experience, the culmination of my flirtation with mechanistic theory. Over the previous year, right alongside everything else that had been going on, I'd allowed myself to become in beguiled by the work of Jerzy Konarski, a Polish physiologist whose book, Integrative Activity of the Brain, published in 67, was said to exist at the meeting place of Sherrington, Pavlov, and Freud. All through 68 and into 69, I was fascinated by this theory of drives and anti-drives, by the power of a scheme of simplification, and I amplified this fascination with an obsessive elaboration of my own, filled with schemas and arrows and diagrams. I'd forgotten all about this, but my friend Mark came upon some of my diagrams from the, those days while looking for something else downstairs amidst my files the other day, and he declared them far along on the road to insanity. Finally, though, there in London, 200,000 words into this grotesque Pavlovian folly, the torso of a massive overarching theory of human behavior, the project fell apart of its own weight. <laughs> 
It was something like what happens, happened to Wittgenstein when he was confronted by his friend's question, oh yeah, well what is the logical structure of this gesture? Somebody said that to Wittgenstein. Whereupon the entire propositional calculus fell apart and he fell from his early philosophy right through to his later work. My own drive scheme could accommodate everything except peacefulness, enoughness, satiate, satiety, repletion. These were totally off its and my path, and so the whole thing imploded. Thankfully, mercifully. Chuckling now, marveling, almost disbelieving, Oliver notes, some years later I wrote of Luria that he'd been a Pavlovian, a Pavlocidal Pavlovian to which he replied, that isn't true of me, but it may have been true of you. So anyway, we talk more about all kinds of things. And then uh, toward the end, this is right to before the book itself is published. Um, I thought I'd read for another two or three pages. Uh, and this will give you a sense of the wider book, but also he's about to, he gives a lecture on the neurology of the soul, the implications of which I think might be of some interest to some of you. But I'll start with something just before that. Oliver calls nervous about the lecture he is to give tomorrow night. It's going to be at the New York Public Library. Uh, and it'll be his real coming out. I mean, uh, he's been publishing pieces in the New York Review of Books that have been getting more and more notice. And these are the books that will, pieces that will become uh, the man who mistook his wife within about nine months. But so there's lots of people who are going to be attending. Oliver calls nervous about the lecture he is to give tomorrow night. I suppose it's procrastination, but instead of preparing for the talk, I've launched into a whole new story. I tell him I don't have time to hear the whole thing right now. I'm just rushing to an appointment, but could he summarize it? Ah, yes, he says. Sudden unexpected outbreak of genius and salaciousness in an 89-year-old woman brought on by neurosyphilis. All right then, can't wait, I say. Later he explains. This one concerns an 89-year-old Albanian lady who came into the clinic with, with her 92-year-old husband. She'd been enjoying a slow, dignified, winding down sort of existence, but now she was complaining that she was all abuzz, and indeed she was. She, was, she displayed a remarkable efflorescence, flirtatiousness, salaciousness, wit, intelligence, and absurd, dizzying vitality. Do you think, she presently confided, that it could be Cupid's disease? She explained that 65 years before, she had worked in a brothel in Salonica, from whence she'd been rescued by her husband. Up to now, she'd had no complaint, but we tested her, and her hunch proved correct. Spirochetes were rioting in her brain. It was a complex situation because, in some ways, she was enjoying her rejuvenescence, although in others, she felt it undignified, and she worried about the illness's progress into the future, that she might go right past the border and into dementia. And what she wanted to know was, could we keep her just as she was? Well, as things developed, the question proved more moot because a few weeks later she contracted pneumonia and she quickly died. At which point uh, he goes into a conversation about Thomas Mann, who he describes as a truly wicked old man, the late Mann. The next morning over the phone, Oliver tells me, still concerned about the coming talk, he decided to photocopy a few things in preparation. Descartes, Pascal, Nietzsche. Only now he has 200 pages of these copies. The next night at the New York Public Library, Susan Sontag introduces Oliver as one of the best living writers in the English language. This was very Susan Sontag to know about somebody before you did and to let you know that she did and to let you know that you were worthless. Jasper Johns is seated behind me. It's that sort of crowd. Oliver begins, it's lovely and terrifying to be here. The title I've chosen for this talk, Neurology and the Soul, is provocative and possibly mad. It self-consciously echoes William James's reflex action and theism. And to the extent it contrasts materialism and vitalism, scientism and religion, body and soul, it is the oldest subject in the world. Although it is a particularly new one today, what with the rise of, in such notions as artificial intelligence, robots, personal computers, etc. Continuing. The modern age is traceable to Descartes with his early insistence, insistence on viewing man as a machine. Quoting the meditations, I regard, this is Descartes, I regard the human being as a machine so built, put together of bone, nerve, muscle, vein, blood, and skin, that still, although it had no mind, it would not fail to move in all the same ways as the present, since it does not move by direction of its will or mind, but only by arrangement of its organs. <laughs> 
And indeed, Oliver, he was the first to consider that a human being just might be an automaton, though there would be many to follow from Sherrington through Pavlov, all of them completely alienated from notions of soul, imagination, and the like. On the other hand, Oliver suggests, if one has a mechanical view of human nature, a sort of disassociation may occur, and one may oneself become more machine-like. He goes on to quote a passage of great pathos from Darwin's autobiography, where the great man speaks of his loss of interest in music, how he has become, quote, a machine for grinding particulars into theorems. Throughout the lecture, Oliver props his glasses on his forehead, then drops them back down. Enough of an introduction, he finally says. Now on to some neurological stories. For as a doctor, one is continuously confronted with neurological preparations on the one hand and existential situations and dramas on the other. William James, he interrupts himself, referred incessantly to the soul in, in his conversation, but banished the word from his physiology. Someday, though, he nevertheless mused, James mused, perhaps souls will have their inning, and I want to give souls their inning. He then moves through a series of stories, many of the ones he'd been regaling his friends and colleagues and increasingly his readers with over the past several months, before eventually he begins to wind things up. Perhaps two final examples, he suggests. People with Parkinsonian indeed begin to walk like robots. I recall a music teacher unmusicked by his Parkinsonism. But precisely to the extent that, as Eliot reminds us, you are the music while the music lasts. Just so, the antidote to Parkinsonism is music. If the Parkinsonian suffers from inertia, the remedy is at, at times can consist precisely in artfulness, art-fusedness. And then as well, there is my, my own story. He goes on to rehearse some of the stations along his leg journey, the book being due out now within a few weeks, concluding by noting how during recovery, he began to experience an almost hallucinatory in-plane of Mendelssohn, whereupon he recovered his own kinetic melody. Nietzsche says one listens to music with one's muscles, that one is precisely moved. Walking is a melody and not just a mechanical consecu consecution. It is mechanical, but not just mechanical. William Harvey, the great person, the great scientist uh, who worked on, who discovered circulation of the blood, as a young man, went to Galileo's lectures. And the first part of his book on animal motion was a Galilean analysis. But in his second half, he concluded that such an analysis was necessarily incomplete because animal motion is essentially graceful, musical, transcendental. Pulling things together, Oliver now soars to his conclusion. The Cartesian notion of man as a machine is tremendously powerful and indeed was absolutely necessary for the rise of empirical objective science. But it is not enough. It cannot tell us about the personal, the I, inside the physiological. A purely physiological explanation offends common sense and one's own egotism. Mechanistic neurology needs to be completed by an existential neurology, a face, internal landscape of the individual. Until we achieve such a conjunction, we can never hope to, fa to fathom the mysteries of perception and action, but will remain lost in the empty labyrinths of empiricism. We need, if it's not a contradiction in terms, a science of the individual, or at the very least, one that does not do violence to the individual. Much applause followed by a truly vivid and vivifying question and answer session. One person asks Oliver, uh, what Oliver makes of the question of the transcendence of the soul. I can provide no sense to the notion of a dismembered soul, Oliver replies. I am sp speaking precisely of the embodiment of a soul. And behaviorism? Ah, the infernal science, puppetry. Behaviorism deals with an impassive it and makes no attempt to bring out the active I. An active science would give support for the free idea of freedom provide the frame for the picture. Indeed, we've spent a century building the scaffolding for such an analysis. Now it's time to paint a few pictures. Do you believe in God? Another person asks him. I believe in the divine. Mendelssohn is divine. I believe in grace. 
All natural movements are graceful. I believe in the mythical mathematics of heaven, which is to say grace beyond the algorithm of causality. What about out-of-body experiences in those who have just returned from the brink of death? Hell, Oliver replies, one has visions of heaven all the time. I think I'll stop there and maybe open it to a conversation. A lot has been written about the way that modern technology affects the way we view the world. Like I'm thinking of like Heidegger writing about in framing, that kind of thing. If Sachs, so you talked about his thoughts about viewing humans mechanistically, if he had thoughts about kind of this more general viewing the whole world through the lens of technology and what he thought about that. I think that's precisely one of the, I mean, one of the things he was thinking about. And again, that particular passage is from 1980. His thoughts changed over the years. Uh, toward the end, he was working very closely with Francis Crick and, and uh, Christopher Koch and, and Gerald Edelman and people like that. Gerald Edelman, as you may know, has an extraordinary kind of Darwinian view of the, of the life of an individual's brain, how, how things evolve, uh, both in the brain and the brain in turn with regard to mind. Oliver was somewhat dubious about, as I think a lot of people are, whether, whether brain science is ever going to reach an account of, co of consciousness, how, how you get from these things firing to the experience of being alive, uh, uh, which is, is the big question, as, as they say. Um, he was, in his own practice, uh, he was driven crazy by the requirements of, of mechanistic medicine nowadays. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the 15 minutes that it, you're given to see a patient and then the, the checklist of things you have to do and you spend an hour later on trying to work your way through the bureaucracy to get the pills to the patient or whatever you're trying to do. And he never paid attention to it. He regularly would spend two, three, four hours with the patient and get paid for 15 minutes, which is one of the reasons he was church mouse poor. Um, but but um, he was suspicious generally across the board of this. On the other hand, he was not a Luddite. He realized there were things that had to be done. Um, but the thing that's interesting, by the way, is that I described how he's completely ignored and, and, uh, and repudiated and dismissed. When I used to tell people in 1980 that I was doing a, a profile of sex, to the extent that anybody had heard of him, they said, oh, come on, he's just making that stuff up. One of the things that's really important, by the way, in that thing he said about being a clinical ontologist is, he, is how are you, how do you be? But another way of putting it is, what's your story? In other words, people who had been warehoused, who had been treated as, as, you know, as logs in a pile by every other doctor, who had been subject, had been subverted or, or, or reduced, let's say, to, uh, to, to just, uh, you know, objects. The great challenge was to make, bring them back to their subjectivity again, to their experience of being in the world as subjects, as agents. And that involved often helping them. When he gets criticized for making up stories, what, kind of what's not noticed is the therapeutic value of the stories he and the patient together would make the patient up from a, from a, from a very, you know, and part of it was you are, are privileged in a strange sort of way to be in extremities of, of human living and can come back and tell us things that we can't get otherwise. And this is just a hugely important thing. He would endlessly, I went on, when I went on rounds with him, he would, he would often say to the patient, well, you're the doctor that nobody knows you better than you. And that was partly a way of saying, you know, come back to yourself, you know, and so forth. Um, but yes, absolutely, he was, he was very suspect of the rapid technologization. Now, having said that, I was starting to say at the beginning of all this, uh, that just before he died at age 82, there was a last birthday for him. He died in August, and this was, would have been July 9th. And at that birthday, uh, the head of the Columbia 
medical school's neurology department said that nowadays, this is three years ago, that of the, when, peop, when kids apply, or you know, newly minted doctors apply to do residency in neurology, postdoctorate reg, residency, fully 70% of them quote Oliver Sacks. I mean, the huge change he made, he had a huge effect on Tourette's or on Parkinsonians or on, on de the world of the deaf or on you know, all kinds of people, people with face blindness. You know, he, he had a huge, huge impact on these people. But the biggest impact he had was on medicine itself. Um, Atul Gawande, for example, says that he was, without doubt, the most important person in his development as a doctor. So I think that there are doctors and I'd be curious whether, I'm, from you, whether there are people here who are struggling with that question of, uh, as he, uh, of how you do a science of the individual that is just not algorithmically slicing things finer and finer. I mean, one science of the individual, I suppose, is Cambridge Analytica, where you slice them so finely that you think you know everything about them, but that's just puppetry, that's Pavlovian. What would it be like and is it even possible, or, or the phrase he says, is it possible to have a science of the individual or at least one that doesn't violate the individual? It seems to me that that's a big thing that you people have to worry about. I read The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat at a formative age, I think I was 11, and it, it stuck with me very deeply. And it's actually quite sad because I, I remember the 89-year-old woman and how she was kind of happy that she would be stuck in the state when they said, oh, yeah, we can give you the antibiotics, but you'll be stuck. I, I don't remember her dying in, in right. the book. I mean, <laughs> so that was, uh, that's sad. Um, I was kind of curious, um, did Dr. Sachs identify himself in any of uh, any neurodiverse categories? Did he self-identify? Well, he, at the end of his life, he finally writes an autobiography. Oh, he, he's been hinting at it all along. Uh, a great drama, this isn't a neuro category, uh, but a great drama in his life was the blight of his existence that he was gay. His mother had, uh, who was, by the way, the first female surgeon in England, an OBGYN surgeon, and to whom he was very, very close, although kind of weirdly so. Uh, she knew that he was a prodigy they all did, but they didn't know what to do with him. It was an Orthodox Jewish family, so she, for example, when he was eight years old, would bring home stillborn fetuses for him to dissect. And when, she was, when he was 12, she would bring him to an autopsy of a 12-year-old boy who committed suicide, because she thought that would be interesting for him, and, and, <laughs> as one does. And, and she used to read him. Now, this is, by the way, a really weird Orthodox Jewish family. She, from when he was four, she would read him her favorite author, D.H. Lawrence. They were very close, and then when she found out when he was 20, when he was 18, excuse me, that he was gay, he told his father that his father was questioning him, and he told his father, who was also a doctor, father, I'm a homosexual, please don't tell mother, it would destroy her. And she came barreling down the stairs and ripped into him for three hours of what he called deuteronomical cursing. Filth of the bowel, you are an abomination, I wish you had never been born. That is the voice he fled from a few years later to California for five years. It never left his head. He, he quit drugs and sexuality completely, cold turkey basically, and at the time I met him, he had been celibate for 15 years, uh, and would talk about it being the blight of his life. He hoped it didn't affect his, his uh, science. And I, being a California boy myself, which is, Oliver, nobody cares. You know, you know that nobody cares. And he said, you talk like my shrink. By the way, in a partial answer to your question, he was in psychoanalysis for 50 years, two to three times a week, with the same person, which is either one of the great triumphs of psychoanalysis or one of the great catastrophes. I'm never sure quite which. But, uh, <laughs> but um, he had tremendous empathy, and when he was talking about a Tourette, he could very quickly become Tourettic, you know, and when he was talking about, uh, he, he, he didn't exactly identify, but he did imaginatively project into what a, a psychoanalyst friend of his called the community of the refused, 
uh, going back to the thing about his homosexuality, uh, his shrink apparently said to him, uh, "You are the least, uh, you are the least affected by gay liberation of anybody I've ever met." And his reply was, "Yes, it's true. I sit in my cell, the door flung open, listening to the to the partying and the dancing outside the prison gates, but I do not leave my cell." And he insisted he never would. In the end, he actually did. The last seven years of his life, he finally uh, fell in love. I mean, hell, he was falling in love all the time. But, and not people were falling in love with him twice as often, and it, nothing clicked until the end. But, um, but I don't, a, a person who would be better qualified to talk about that part of his life uh, would be uh, Mike, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Silverman or Michael Silverman at Wired Magazine. Uh, the Neurotribes Yeah, author? the Neurotribes, who was very close to Oliver toward the end and, and, and I think would perhaps talk about some spectrum sorts of issues with him. Uh, he, I, he had a wonderful time with Stephen Wiltshire, for example, the, the autistic artist. Uh, uh, he was, and, and with Temple Grandin. Uh, it's funny, my daughter became his goddaughter. Uh, or he, or we stayed. Uh, I was about to say that 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 after four w years of working on this project, which was going to be a big New Yorker profile, he asked me to stop uh, after I'd done my index of my notes, which was 250 pages long, and my and I'd been uh, you know 100,000 words into the piece. He said he just couldn't deal with it, the the, the gay stuff, and we stayed friends. And my god, my uh, daughter was his godfather, uh, goddaughter, and. He and my daughter, who at the point in time was 11, and Temple Grandin would have hours-long conversations about whether Data <laughs> could have emotions, uh, the character from, from uh, The Next Generation. And one of the great honors of Oliver's life was when, uh, on one of the shows in The Next Generation, a starship was named after him. The, the, there is the SS Sachs, or whatever, the Starship Federation. Uh, so I, I think, I don't know that, I think he had extraordinary capacity to empathize with people in the community of the refused, as that, as that was described. I don't know whether he himself was on all of those, uh, those uh, spectrums himself. You're not saying that he self-identified. He wouldn't put it that way. Uh -huh. self, the concept of self-identification, all these sorts of things are fairly recent. And the, what he would do would just do an absolutely astonishing per impersonation of a Tourette person or an autistic person. And he could just inhabit that completely, and I think that may have been partly because he was, and it also may have been partly because of the drug experiences he'd had. He'd, he, he, his slogan as a, uh, in that period of his life was every dose and overdose. In his uh, bodybuilding phase, he would, uh, he would get on a motorcycle, he would take a milkshake with 10 times the amount of speed that would kill you. But as I say, he was very, very strong. And he would get on his motorcycle and motorcycle from LA to Crater Lake in Oregon and back without stopping, except for gas. He would start out on a Friday night in LA and be back uh, on Monday morning to take up his residency again. Is that on the spectrum? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you mostly answered my question, but but maybe you can speak a little bit more broadly to how did he? Like, he's clearly a, a, like a, a precociously unusual individual mm -hmm. in, in so many ways. Prodigiously. Yeah. Uh, how did he come to grips with who he was more broadly? Not just about being gay, or or do you think his being gay was was so overarching in his conception? He, of who he, he was? would have insisted not, and I don't think his being gay was the overarching thing in his life. I think his attitude towards his being gay was central to everything. It helped him identify with people and so forth. And in terms of how he, I mean, it, it was a long process. He, and, and it was only at the end, the last seven years, that he very gradually came out. And by the way, very gradually, he was living with Billy Hayes, who's a wonderful writer himself, uh, wrote the book The Anatomist, a, a lovely man, so for, the, for whatever reason at that point. Well, the reason was that he had had uh, eye cancer. He had lost his eye seven years before he died. He had eye cancer. He lost his eye. He had had a brush with death. 
And shortly after that, he finally opened himself to somebody. Um, that was the cancer that re returned seven years later in his liver, and that's what he died of eventually. But even then, even when he had been living with, with Billy for three years, at the point of this story, uh, I was doing a festival. Bill T. Jones, the choreographer, had asked me to put together a, a start doing a series of five-day ideas festivals at his dance studio. And we agreed I'd do Oliver Sacks first, and the next year I'd do James Baldwin. Uh, and, and so we did 20 events. And the 20 events uh, were things from ferns to chemistry to bodybuilding to swimming to, to Tourette's to the deaf to all kinds. And then we had plays and we had operas. It was a fantastic thing. He claimed he wasn't going to come to any of them. Uh, and then I said, and one of the things we're going to do, I said, is I've already been in contact with many of the top poets in New York, and we've all agreed we're going to do a reading of your two favorite poets, W.H. Auden and Tom Gunn, at which point he'd been living with Billy Hayes for three years already, publicly, although not proclaimingly. He had him in hiding it, at which point he said, absolutely not. I said, what do you mean not absolutely not? He says, you know what that's code for. And I said, English poets living in America who've died? And he said, he said, no, it's obviously about homosexuality and that is off limits. He said he wasn't going to come to any of the events. He came to all of them. And the next day, he started his autobiography, in which he did finally come out. So he comes out at the end in a somewhat stylized way. I mean, I, th I think uh, in this book, you see more of the slashingness of, of the whole thing. Um, he. He always felt himself, I think, to be odd, to be, uh, uh, well, he called uh, Temple Grandin an anthropologist on Mars, although it's, it seems to me that he's referring to himself in that situation. He, he, there's a wonderful passage at one point in the book where he says that, that he has incredible sense of natural world and of the world inside an individual, but he has no sense of the social world. The thing, as he said, it, it must make New York such a fascinating city. He just didn't get it and was ridiculously, he, in terms of, he had no sense of popular culture. I was regularly the person who was fact checking for him or, or uh, one day he calls me and says, I have a patient who's, uh, who's uh, stuck in the 60s. He's, he's, this was in 1980 something. You know, he, he thinks it's still 1968, 69. He endlessly talks to me about his favorite band. I, and I can't remember the name. I'm trying to write about it, but I can't remember the name. I think it's The Happy Corpses. And I said, The Grateful Dead? He said, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you had those kind of moments with him all the time. He had no idea what was going on. Uh, but uh, And he felt awkward somewhat about that, and also kind of proud of being awkward. you know. And so. He was very much a mixed bag. Before he passed away, he wrote um, a pretty beautiful essay in the New York Review books on memory. Uh -huh. And uh, it kind of leads with the idea of he has this vivid recollection of his childhood, this one moment that, in fact, is actually his brother's. Right. And it's a look at kind of the faultiness of memory and its significance and, and really explored. I'm just curious, in your work and your time with him, how you grappled with some of the faultiness of memory, and then kind of as a caveat or kind of carry on from that is as we work in kind of a digital realm, how that digital documentation of emails, photographs, videos, and the preservation of very pinpointed moments mm -hmm. uh, affects or colors how we remember. Yeah. No, he thought a lot about memory, especially at the end. And, and there was also a case of, uh, that happened t t uh, toward the end of his life where Brian Friel, the great, great playwright, uh, wrote a play which was totally a ripoff of an essay that Oliver had written in The New Yorker. And when confronted with this, claimed he had never read the piece. And in fact, he never had. Tina Brown had given him the manuscript of the piece without telling Oliver. And, and so he was right in insisting he hadn't read the New Yorker piece. He, uh, and in fairness to Brickfield, he had been reading all kinds of things. And this is a phenomenon called cryptomnesia, where people uh, 
just lift stuff from other people without realizing they're doing so, and it happens all the time. Um, so there was a lot of that stuff going on, but but uh, he I. I he, he was fascinated by the plasticity, the, the sinuosity, the, the snakiness of, of memory and, and how, and, uh, and I, it's interesting also in this context to think about to what extent the things we have in emails and so forth are factual records either because <laughs> they're also, <laughs> You know, you'll have an email of somebody saying, "I remember he said such and such and such and such." That that is those kinds of details are as squishy as as the others. Uh, that is both the the delight and the horror of being human. Um, and uh, an analogy, by the way, which in some way relates to this, I, and I wanted to lay it out for you. Uh, we he and I used to talk about Nicholas of Cusa all the time. Nicholas of Cusa was a uh, and absolutely worth reading, really, really essential reading, uh, was a uh, 15th century number mystic, uh, 1400 to 1460, I think. He was the Cologne of, uh, the Archbishop of Cologne. He was a diplomat, he was a mathematician. He was a, uh, he figured out that, that the Earth was round and went around the sun long before Copernicus had figured it out. Um, and, uh, and he wrote a book called Learned Ignorance. Um, and he was basically having an argument with Aquinas, who was a few generations earlier. And Aquinas used to think that getting to God, or to the, the big prize, whatever you want to call it, was, a, was like in the way of Aristotle, he, Aquinas was Aristotelian, that if you cataloged all, a book of all the fishes of the world, and a book of all the paintings of the world, and a book of all the ethics of the world, and a book of all the politics of the world, and a book of all the, the trees of the world, and so forth, because these were all part of creation, you would get closer and closer to the creator. And, uh, and uh, Cusa, Nicholas of Cusa, C-U-S-A, had this idea that, no, no, that can't be right. He said, imagine a circle with an n-sided polygon inside of it. So a, a regular triangle, then a square, then a pentagon, and so forth. The more sides you add, the closer you get to the circle. So if you have a million sides, it looks down like the circle. But Cusa says, but actually, no. I mean, the circle has one side. <laughs> this thing has a million sides. The circle has no angles. This thing has a million angles. At some point, Cusa said, you have to make the leap, which he called the leap of faith, from, and that's where Kierkegaard gets the idea, from the cord to the arc, which is as difficult when you start as it is at the end. So, it, it, so uh, and that the difference between being a machine and being a human being is the difference, and the difference between the brain and the mind and the soul, you know, is the difference between a million-sided polygon and a circle. And that uh, uh, a person who's really fascinating in this, in this regard later on is Leibniz who is both doing the calculus, which is the million side of thing, but his philosophy, his essential philosophy, and, and he was uh, Oliver's favorite philosopher, and he called him the ultimate physician. The essential philosophy was the monadology, in which there were infinite spheres in the chain of being in all directions, and each of us inhabited one of those spheres, which inf reflected the infinity of the rest of the world, this is not a calculus thing. This is a, a mystery of, of embeddedness and so forth. And, and, uh, and so Oliver went back and forth between those two also. But, but at, in the end, he was a champion of the circle, I guess. Thank you very much.